we're going to talk about what I consider to be one of the fundamental qualities of success. It is the principle of responsibility. And the bottom line of it is that you are 100% responsible for your life and everything that happens to you. I used to think that setting goals was the key to being successful. But the more I think about it, the more I reflect on it, the more I realize that accepting responsibility for your life is the starting point of all great accomplishment. Because until you accept responsibility, you don't set goals. And if you do set goals, you don't stick to them. You are the architect of your own destiny. You are the master of your own fate. You are behind the wheel of your own life. You are where you are and what you are because of your own conduct and your own behavior. And it's been well said over and over again that it's not the government and it's not our parents and it's not your boss and it's not your family or your bills. It's you. And if ever you want to look for the reason for the way things are going in your life, look in the mirror. And the truly responsible, high-achieving, peak-performing human being always looks in the mirror. If you want things to be different for you, it's up to you to change them. I love the old saying by Henry Ford. He said, never complain, never explain. If you don't like the way things are, change them. And if you're not willing to change them, then don't complain about them. One of the things I've found, and this sometimes is hard to get used to, is the fact that no one else can live your life for you. No one else can make decisions for you. And in the final analysis, no one else really cares. In the final analysis, no one else really cares about you anywhere near as much as you do or will care about yourself. The slogan of the high achiever is always, if it's to be, it's up to me. If it's to be, it's up to me. The acceptance of responsibility for your life is the starting point of true maturity, success, and high achievement. And without the acceptance of responsibility, nothing else is possible. Walking, talking, thinking, and acting like a fully responsible human being gives you a feeling of calmness, confidence, and self-control. We know that we only feel good about ourselves to the degree to which we feel we're in complete control of our own lives. And there is a one-to-one -one relationship between the amount of responsibility you accept and the amount of control you have over your life. In the world of work, you will always rise to the level of responsibility you are willing to accept for results. Your income, your status, your security, your power will always tend to be equal to the responsibilities you take on. Emerson said you can tell how big a person is by how big their responsibilities are. This is one distinct area where winners and losers part company. Winners always look upon themselves as the cause of what happens to them. Losers are always blaming someone or something else. Now, why should this be? Well, of course, from the expediency factor, we know that people always seek the fastest and easiest way to get the things they want. And if something goes wrong, the thing that they want is to get off the hook. So the fastest and easiest way is always to blame someone else. But when we blame someone else, to that degree, we give control of the problem to that other person. And we take control away from ourselves, and we become more negative, and we become more frustrated the more we try to make other people responsible for things in our life that we don't like. In our study of negative emotions, we found that almost all anger, all frustration, all hostility comes from the attempt to blame others for problems in our lives rather than accepting responsibility. In fact, if you stop blaming other people, you'll find that most of your negative emotions will go away. If you stop blaming your past and stop blaming your present and stop blaming your parents and your boss and your relationships, you will find that it's almost impossible to become angry if you can't blame anybody. And the way you stop blaming is to accept responsibility. The mark of the high achiever is that he or she refuses to blame anyone or anything. High achievers discipline themselves, control themselves, to keep their minds calm, clear, and balanced. Interesting about balanced minds. The great psychiatrist Thomas Sass said there's no such thing as mental illness. There are merely varying degrees of irresponsibility. And John T. Malloy, in his book, Live for Success, said that the one big difference between winners and losers, and he said, let's not mince words, let's call them what they are, is that losers never accept responsibility, and winners always do. When things go well for losers, they blame it on luck. And when things go poorly for losers, they blame it on the system. But winners accept both the credit and the blame for everything that happens to them. Fully responsible adults always look upon themselves as self-employed. They act as if they own the place. They treat the company they work for as though it belonged to them. And about 10 or 15 percent of the people will raise their hands. And I'll say, now that was a trick question. And it's the only trick question of the evening. And I'm going to ask that question again in the light of what we're talking about right now. And then I say, now how many people here are really self-employed? 
and most of the people in the audience get it. And what they get is this, is that the worst mistake you can ever make in your life is to ever think that you work for anybody else but yourself. Everybody is self-employed. You are self-employed, I am self-employed, and all peak performers in every field and industry look upon themselves as though they worked for themselves. Even if somebody else signs their paycheck, they look upon themselves as being self-employed. And they treat the company as though it belonged to them. They treat the company as though everything that happened in that company was theirs. They accept full responsibility. If a paper clip falls on the floor, they pick it up. They never say, that's not my job. When they refer to their company, they say, us and our and we. This company instead of they and them and the boss and so on. Now, if you were an employer and you had to promote somebody and you had two people working for you, both of the same talents and abilities, and one person just looked upon it as a job and said, a job's a job and I don't think about my job when I'm not at work, and came in at 9 o'clock and left at 5, and the other person treated the company like it belonged to them. They treated the company like it was part of their personal property. They came a little bit earlier and they worked a little bit harder and they stayed a little bit later and they cared about the company. And you as an employer had to promote one of those two. Which one would you select? Which one would you give the greater opportunities to? Which one would you give the additional training and upgrading of skills to? Which one would you want to promote in your company? The one who treated the company like it belonged to them or the one who just treated the company like it was a job? Now, if you can understand this simple principle, you'll understand one of the key reasons why people move to the executive suite and move ahead rapidly in their careers and other people go nowhere. Because bosses, managers, executives are very alert to the degree of commitment that you make to your work. And wherever you see an employee, and I train many executives on this, wherever you see an employee who is not totally committed to the company and to their work, you see a problem and you see a person that you should never uh, allocate more responsibility to. We are all self-employed. You are the president of your own personal services corporation. You go out into the marketplace and you sell your services to the highest bidder. You're responsible for marketing your services. You're responsible for production. You're responsible for quality control of your work. You're responsible for research and development, upgrading your skills, and you're responsible for finance. Now, a very important point. Because when we go to school in the first grade or kindergarten, we stay in school for 12 years. Maybe we go on to university or college. But we get the impression that our education is controlled by and dictated by forces outside of ourselves, the state, the government, the school system. When we come out of school, we sometimes make the mistake of thinking that if we are to be educated further, it is up to our employer to do it. And this is one of the worst mistakes that you can make because irrespective of whether or not your employer offers you training opportunities, you are 100% responsible for continuing to upgrade your skills because you are working for yourself in every single case. A good question to ask yourself is this. If you were to take the stock of your personal company public, would you buy shares in you? Are you the kind of stock that is growing in value and profits every year? Are you the kind of stock that is going up in the marketplace? Would you sell stock in you to widows and orphans as a secure investment, or has your stock kind of flattened out in the marketplace? In other words, are you a growth stock, or are you a stock for a long-term hold? Because truly successful people look upon themselves as growth stocks, and they work upon themselves every day and every week and every year to make the value of what they do worth more as time passes. The winning human being accepts full responsibility for continuously upgrading his or her skills, becoming more and more valuable every year. Now here's another area of responsibility. The winner always asks, what results are expected of me? One of the qualities of peak performers is that they are always very results-oriented. They always ask themselves, why am I on the payroll? And if you're not sure why you're on the payroll, the first thing that you have to do is go and sit down with your boss and ask him, why am I on the payroll? Now, you don't have to use these words, but here's a very simple technique. Take and write out a job description of what you think that you're on the payroll to do. Write out a list of all the things that you're supposed to accomplish and give it to your boss and have your boss organize that list in order of priority, which is most important, which is second in importance, which is third in importance, and then always work on what is most important to your boss. Ask yourself, what can I and only I do that if done well will make a real difference to my company? If you own your own company, this question is even more important. But working for another company, this is the key to rapid advancement and promotion. And do what will make a difference. 
accept responsibility for specific results and always results that will make a difference. Winners always focus on solutions. They ask, where do we go from here? What do we do from here? Now, this is a big difference between winners and losers. Winners always look to the future, and losers always look to the past. Winners always look to what can be done, and losers always look at who's to blame. Losers focus on problems. Winners focus on solutions. Winners always look to themselves when there is a problem. Losers always look to others. So if you want to achieve success within your work, always look to yourself whenever things don't go right. The rejection of responsibility leads to negative emotions. It leads to stress. It leads to denial and anger and frustration and often psychosomatic illness. The negative mind actually depresses the immune system and makes the body that your ability to forgive others, to accept full responsibility for your own life and not blame others or hold grudges against others is a hallmark of healthy personality. That your personality is healthy to the degree to which you can freely forgive and forget offenses against you. And if you cannot forgive offenses against you, to that degree you are held back from success. And the more grudges you have, the more bitter you are, the less forgiving you are, the more unhappy you will be all of your life. So make it a rule, as they say, never to let the sun go down on your anger. Make it a rule to forgive everybody in your life who has ever done anything that has hurt you and let it go past so that you can commit all of your energies toward accomplishing the things that you really want in life. Well, what have we learned with regard to responsibility? Number one is that the acceptance of responsibility for your life is the stepping stone to peak performance. That until you accept responsibility for your life, nothing happens. Number two is the more self-responsible you feel, the more control you have and the better you like yourself and the higher is your self-esteem. Number three, the expression of negative emotions caused by blaming others causes you to lose control and suffer diminished self-esteem. So catch yourself and stop yourself from blaming others by catching yourself and saying, I am responsible. I am responsible. I am responsible. Remember, the responsible person is solution-oriented, focused on the future, rather than the past, in what can be done versus who did what. The responsible person always approaches a problem as though there were a logical solution and starts off by asking questions like, what exactly is the problem? Start off by defining the problem clearly and then asking, what are all the possible causes of this problem? And focus the attention of everyone involved on the future. Then the third question is, what are all the possible solutions? Where do we go from here? What do we do from this moment onward? How can we resolve this situation? Not who's guilty or who's responsible or who did what. Remember an important point in life is that people make mistakes. All human beings make mistakes because we are anxious to get things and to do things the fastest and easiest way because often we're ignorant and we don't know everything we need to know because often we're ambitious and we're in a hurry because often we are vain and our egos get in the way. Because of these things, we make mistakes. And all human beings make mistakes. And a person who cannot accept the fact that others make mistakes is not cut out for greatness and is not cut out for leadership. Number five, the acceptance of complete responsibility for your success is the starting point of all great achievement, which is to sit down and say that anything that is going to happen to you or for you in life is up to you. That you cannot wait or hope that other people will do things for you, that you must take complete charge. Now, you will find a very interesting thing, that when you accept total responsibility for your life, other people will help you. And if you don't, nobody will help you, and even if they do, it won't do any good. So say to yourself, what is it that I want to accomplish? Where do I want to go? Where do I want to be? What do I want to have? And what do I have to do to get there? And then take full charge of the process. Number six, make a habit of forgiving others, never carrying grudges around. Keep your mind calm, positive, and focused on your goals. Your ability to eliminate the expression of negative emotions, to keep your mind positive by not becoming angry or frustrated, is a hallmark of the successful personality and the healthy personality. And your tendency to blame others, to hold grudges, not to forgive others, is something that can cause you to fail and underachieve in life. Number seven, finally, ask yourself each day, what kind of a company would my company be if everybody in it was just like me. What kind of a company would my company be 
if everybody in it was just like me? This is the question of the truly responsible individual. And you will be amazed at how rapidly an attitude of responsibility can accelerate your career. If you walk, talk, and act like a responsible, self-assured individual, you will begin to feel calm, confident, and positive about yourself. If you will resist the expediency factor, the tendency to blame others when things go wrong, if you will discipline yourself to accept full responsibility for what happens in your life, it will raise your self-esteem and make you feel much better about yourself and everything that you're doing. By practicing the self-discipline necessary to refrain from blaming anyone for anything, you will develop courage, character, and self-esteem. If you do what successful people do, you will be successful too, and all successful men and women are self-responsible. And wherever I've seen an unhappy, unsuccessful person in life, almost invariably you will see a person who is trying to get on the wrong end of the law of sowing and reaping. They are sowing bad in their relationships, sowing laziness in their work, and they cannot understand why they reap unhappiness and frustration in their lives. That in every single area of life, this law of sowing and reaping seems to explain with complete accuracy what is happening to us. It says that whatever you sow, that also shall you reap. It also says that what you are reaping now is a result of what you have sown in past time periods. That your harvest will come from the same seed that you cast upon the soil of your life. And it is always you who is the planter. It is always you who are the farmer who farms the field. Now, many people don't realize this, and they're in the position of the farmer who goes out to the field and says, first you give me a crop, and then I'll give you some seed. We know that in the great flow of life, we always have to put the seed in first before we get the crop. And whatever seed we put in the ground, that's going to determine what the harvest is going to be. Whatever you sow in your relationships, you reap in your relationships. We know that children are largely the reflection of their parents' treatment of them. If you raise children with dignity and love and self-respect and praise and approval and encouragement, you will have positive, self-confident, happy, successful children. And if you criticize them and condemn and complain and harp at them continually, you'll have children with low self-concepts, poor self-images, with lack of self-confidence, who will get into all kinds of troubles in life to compensate for their feelings of deficiency. A marriage or love relationship between two people accurately reflects what the two people put into it. If you want more out of your marriage or more out of your relationship, all you have to do is sow more of what you want. And whatever you sow in your work, whatever you sow in your profession, whatever you sow in your business, you will reap in your rewards. I've seen the interesting experience where people get together and put up a restaurant. And they'll put all of their savings into the restaurant. And when the restaurant is open, they'll try to save money by putting small portions on the plates. And they can't understand why the patrons come once and then go away and never come back again. They don't realize that they have sown the seeds of their own financial disaster by what they give to their customers. Whatever you sow in your work, you will reap in your rewards. The number of hours that you put in, the quality and quantity of service that you give to others will always determine your rewards. And if you wish to increase those rewards, as we say, you can always focus on what is under your complete control, the quality and the quantity of your efforts. Because of the law of expediency, most people try to get away with doing the very least for the very most, which is the basis of the entire union movement. Wherever you see individuals or groups who increasingly demand greater rewards for less service, you see the sowing of the seeds of financial and economic disaster. As we mentioned before, Chrysler Corporation, one of the biggest companies in the world, almost went bankrupt because the union demands had been exceeded to for so many years, and finally when push came to shove, the company almost went under. The winners in life focus on putting in as much as they can, knowing that the crop will always follow. Now this is interesting because it's not the principle of sowing and reaping. It's not the principle of compensation. It's called the law of sowing and reaping. It is the law of compensation. It is the law of cause and effect. And what it simply says is that the more that you put in, the more you will get out by law, not by accident this customer, the one who must use your work. Zig Ziglar says, you can get anything you want in life if you just help enough other people get what they want, which means that you can achieve all of your goals in life if you'll just find enough different ways to achieve the goals of enough other people. A good friend of mine who's a salesman who used to always sell mass-produced items to department stores told me that if you want to dine with the classes, you have to sell to the masses. And it's probably very true. Our entire capitalist system is based on mass production for the masses. 
And the more ideas you can have of how to serve more people better, the more ideas you have on how to enrich the lives of others, the more prosperous and successful you will be. The law of service says that we fulfill ourselves as human beings to the degree to which we lose ourselves in serving others, in helping others, in improving the lives of others. Alan Cox, in his book, The Achievers, found that the most successful executives in the industries that he surveyed were those who were so totally involved in their work that they really lost themselves in their work. And in losing themselves in their work, they became the most valuable to the company, which takes us back, of course, to our principle of excellence, that you can only be successful doing what you do in an excellent fashion. Tom Peters, in his book, In Search of Excellence, where he studied 42 of the most successful companies in America, says that excellent companies are those that have an obsession with customer service. They think about their customers all the time. They talk about their customers all the time. Everything that they do internally is aimed at somehow improving the quality and quantity of their service to their customers. And in those companies, the customer is king. I'm always surprised when I see companies that spend an enormous amount of money advertising to bring people in the door and then have them served with indifferent and surly serving people. Restaurants that spend an enormous amount of money to get you to try them out and then put little portions of poorly prepared food on the plate. It's absolutely amazing how much money is spent in advertising on the one end to get customers who try the business once and then go away and never come back. In fact, if you can become excellent in customer service, if you can become excellent at treating people like kings, then you can open almost any kind of a business and you'll be successful. Remember, we're all in the business of customer satisfaction. The basic rule for starting a new business is and has always been find a need and fill it. Find something that people need. Find something that consumers need that nobody else is offering them or find something that you can give to them that's better and cheaper and faster and serve it. In the studies of self-made millionaires in America, we find an interesting thing. We find that most of them made their millions in very mundane tasks. The greatest single source of self-made millionaires is dry cleaning businesses, followed by commercial or instant printing businesses, followed by vending machine leasing. That most of the millionaires in America came from offering goods and services that are not high-tech, but which are ordinary and which people consume and need every single day. Remember, everything that you do in life that increases your ability to render useful service to others increases your value in the world. It increases the quality and quantity of the seeds that you are sowing, and it must eventually increase the quality and quantity of the harvest that you are reaping. The greatest men and women in history are those who dedicated their lives to service. When we think of Dr. Albert Schweitzer of Africa, whom I worked with shortly before his death, who at the age of 38 set off to build a hospital on the banks of the Uguwe River, north of Lamborghini in Central Africa, and who spent 53 years ministering to the natives on the banks of that river, serving other people, and who will go down in history as probably the great humanitarian of the 20th century. Or you think of someone like Mother Teresa, who's worked all her life in the slums of Calcutta. Now, she hasn't made an awful lot of money, but she will be remembered decades, maybe even centuries, after some of the great millionaires of today have died away and are forgotten. In fact, true greatness only seems to emerge when we are totally absorbed in doing something that benefits other people. Ralph Waldo Trine wrote a book some years ago called What the Whole World is Seeking, and he found that what each one of us needs more than anything else is to find some way to lose ourselves completely in serving others with something that we love to do. The free enterprise system is based on the ethic of serving customers. Anyone who thinks that they have an idea for a newer, better, faster, cheaper way to serve others is free to enter the marketplace and try. We have one of the few societies in the world where every time someone has an idea where they can serve customers with something that they need in a way that they're not being served already, they can enter into the marketplace and offer it. And whenever you see successful business, you should stand up and applause because all successful business is based on somehow giving people something more than they had before. Most entrepreneurial fortunes began with a man or a woman who saw some need that wasn't being met and who successfully entered the market and met it. Look at the success of the hundreds of thousands of men and women who have built great organizations and corporations in the last 200 years of American history, every one of them based on somehow serving others with things that they couldn't get before. All your wealth will come from productivity, from finding better ways to serve others. And the harder you work serving others, the more successful you will be. And the harder you work serving others, the happier you will be. Mark Victor Hansen quoted his father who said that free enterprise means that the more enterprising you are, the freer you are. 
the one common denominator of all self-made millionaires, according to the studies by Dr. Thomas Stanley at the University of Georgia, is that they work hard, hard, hard. They start early, work harder, and stay longer. The average self-made millionaire works over 60 hours per week. And this is the one single factor that they all have in common. In our society, you work eight hours per day for survival. Everything over eight hours is for success. You can tell where you're going to be in three to five years by simply noting the number of hours you work. If you're only working eight hours a day, you're simply staying in place. And heaven help you that the economy doesn't turn down and you lose your job because then you sink very quickly. Everything over eight puts you on the side of the angels. If you can't work more than eight hours at your job, then spend the extra time studying. Delay the gratification of watching television and socializing and fooling around. And take time every single day to study and invest in yourself and make yourself more valuable. Remember, you've got to get into the top 20%. And it's a race because the competition is becoming more and more fierce. In our competitive society, you must work harder than the average to do better than the average and much harder than the average to do much better than the average. And you must work hard, hard, hard for years. The average age of self-made millionaires in America is 57, believe it or not. And most of those people made the bulk of their fortunes after the age of 40. Now, why should that have happened? Well, because in one's 20s, we have a tendency to think that there's a fast, easy way to get rich. So we chase a lot of will-o'-the-wisps and we try a lot of different jobs until we finally get into our 30s. In our 30s, we begin thinking very seriously and realize that we'd better settle down, put down roots, establish ourselves in a given occupation or profession. And finally, it's in our 40s and in our 50s where we have learned enough to be valuable enough to earn the really big money in life. Now, you can start when you're 20 and work very, very hard and develop an expertise and make yourself extremely valuable and you'll be wealthy a lot earlier. But it takes at least 20 years of unrelenting effort to achieve financial security in life. And the sooner you start, the sooner you accomplish it. And as you know, most people never start at all. Feeling needed and valuable builds your self-esteem, causes you to like yourself, and improves every aspect of your personality. 